Well, if you're not one of our regulars in our evening service, we've been reading our way together, confessing our way, I guess, together as a group, what we hold true in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. The Westminster Shorter Catechism is just like a question and answers of the Christian faith and the biblical summary of everything that we believe. And so this evening we find ourselves with question 41 through 43. So I would encourage you to join me in reading this out. Where is the moral law summarily, summarily, that is a good one, comprehended? The moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. Question 42. What is the sum of the Ten Commandments? The sum of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. Question 43. What is the preface to the Ten Commandments? The preface to the Ten Commandments is in these words. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, question 43 is absolutely vital to how we understand the Ten Commandments and how we apply them to our own lives. You see, the, the reason the Ten Commandments were given, the reason the people were to obey, is not so that they could earn favor with God, but as God expressly says here in the preface, because God had set them free, because God had delivered them, they were to obey Him. They were to follow His standards of life. And it's the same thing for us, isn't it? Because God has redeemed us in Christ, we are to obey Him. Well, if you've got your Bibles with you this evening, we're going to be turning to the book of Proverbs, chapter 1 reading from verse 20 through to 33. If you're a visitor here, a couple of weeks ago we started in the book of Proverbs and I had actually planned on just doing one sermon from the beginning and that's now morphed into three, so we'll see where we go from here. Proverbs chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 20 through to 33 this evening, <clears throat> which in my Bible is entitled The Call of Wisdom and I'll be reading from the ESV. This is God's word for you tonight. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand, and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof, because, sorry, therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure, and will be at ease without dread of disaster. And I forgot to turn the slide again, my apologies. Well, before we come to the preaching of God's word, let's just come to him in a time of prayer. 
Father in heaven, we thank you indeed for your word, by, by your word alone do you speak. And, and so we thank you that through your word you have made your salvation known. And through your word you have built up your church. And through your word you have continued to show us how to live. And as we come to your word again this evening, we pray that you would declare it. That Lord, though I speak to a camera which goes out across the internet into other people's screens and into their physical ears, yet Jesus Christ, that you would speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit, that each and every one of us would hear from the living God tonight. That we would be nourished and fed and challenged and conformed to the image of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder when you, when you think of wisdom, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when you think of wisdom? Do you think of, you know, the, the old sage on top of a hill somewhere meditating or the person living in a, in a random shack in the middle of nowhere that people go out and find and ask them for wisdom? Is it the elderly grandfather type figure who seems to have all the answers? Or is it a, a person who you really respect in your life that you would see as wise? And so that's the image you have of a wise person. I wonder if any of you have the image of a woman in your head. No, I don't say that because I think women aren't wise. In fact, most of the time they're more wise than us men. But I say that because... That's what Proverbs uses as a picture. I, I wonder if you picture not just any woman, but a, a lady in a busy town. You know, when we think of wisdom, we tend to think of quietness, don't we? Or do, do you picture someone shouting? Do you picture someone yelling? Well, that's what Solomon uses. Solomon uses the imagery of a lady and he calls her wisdom. She is the embodiment of wisdom. We'll call her Lady Wisdom. And, and he uses her to, to address some significant issues. He uses her to address the world primarily as wisdom speaks to the world. But we'll see he also speaks to you and I. And what we're going to see tonight is that wisdom shouts, wisdom judges, but wisdom invites. Wisdom shouts, wisdom judges, but then also that wisdom invites. So firstly, wisdom shouts. And in order to sort of get into the story of what Solomon does here, we need to sort of get a picture in our mind. You know, get a, get a word picture, and hopefully you're not one of these people that I've just discovered this year that can't picture things. I didn't realize this was a thing until I was teaching Greek this year and discovered one of my students literally cannot picture anything. There's a whole category of people like this, so hopefully you're not one of them. But anyway, I want you to picture in your mind a very busy city, <clears throat> A very bustling city, like lots of people, a crowded marketplace, you know, like you see on Discovery Channel or on those travel shows, and they've got those marketplaces covered in people, and there's tons of people at the gate of the city, and there's people at the marketplace, and there's people at the ends of the street, and it's just everywhere you go, there's people, and it's loud, and it's noisy, and the people are speaking loudly to one another in order to be heard. And on every corner, there's a different, different salesman shouting out his wares, and at every street, there's a popular preacher declaring out his wisdom. And it's in this context that wisdom walks into the street. Solomon says that wisdom comes and shouts in the noisy places. 
in verse 20, it, it cries aloud in the street. So you can imagine wisdom standing in the middle of the street, crying out with a loud voice. You can imagine she goes to the marketplace and she, she raises her voice so that everyone can hear her. She goes to the end of the noisy street and cries out. She goes to the entrance of the city gate and she speaks there. The city gates, the city gates where we were all the elders met. So she, she goes to the marketplace where, where the, the masses are doing their shopping. She goes to the streets where people are traveling. Goes to the ends of the roads where people were arriving or leaving on their journey. And she goes to the leaders of the city. And she heralds her message of wisdom. She cries out her message of wisdom. You see, this, this wisdom that Solomon says God offers, this wisdom is for everyone. Wisdom is not just, it's not just for the sage. It's not just for the elderly. The wisdom is for the elder in the city gate. The wisdom is for the busy mother in the market. The wisdom is for the traveler on the road. And it's for the businessman at the end of the road. Wisdom is on offer for everyone. She cries aloud, looking for someone to hear her. But there's a problem. There's a problem. There's no one to listen, is there? In verse 22, wisdom says, this is what wisdom cries out. Wisdom goes to these places and cries out, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Three classes of people. The simple, the scoffer, and the fool. The, the, the simple because they know nothing. They have no knowledge. So why do you carry on being simple? And, and the scoffer who, who mocks wisdom, calls wisdom stupid, calls what is right wrong, and what is wrong right. And the fool who hates knowledge. Even if it's smart, fool doesn't care. And so in this context, wisdom is shouting out. And, and wisdom shouts out this initial offer to this world. This world who doesn't want wisdom. But before we hear this offer, think for a second. Is this not the picture of our world? Is this, is this not the picture of New Zealand and America and the UK and Africa and all of the West? It's just everywhere. This is a plague on society, isn't it? Where God's wisdom is heralded. And, and the foolish think we're insane. And the scoffers mock us like we're imbeciles. And the simple ignore us in their simplicity. We offer life, and they say we're bigoted idiots offering death. We say euthanasia is wrong because you're killing people. And they say we're the bigots. We say, don't abort your children, we'll take them. And they say, you can't buy our children, we're going to kill them. It's nonsensical, isn't it? Well, actually, it's exactly Romans 1. There's this great reversal that happens when God hands people over to their sin. They will call right wrong and wrong right. They will worship the creature rather than the creator. So you see, we are living in this age. The age that wisdom was speaking to here. And wisdom cries out to our nations. And it cries out to us and it says in verse 23, if you turn at my reproof, behold, 
I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. And so right at the very beginning, right at the very beginning, this this wisdom, lady wisdom, she comes into this busy, busy city and she says, look, stop, stop and listen. Stop and listen to me. I know you don't want to hear this, but if you will just repent of your ways and return to me, I will give you wisdom. I will give you true wisdom that lasts. I will indwell you with my spirit of wisdom and you will truly know. You will have understanding. You see, Lady Wisdom comes and offers them God's blessed life. That's really what wisdom is all about. Wisdom is all about God Offering his creation, offering his image bearers the way of an abundant life. You know, these crazy, crazy gospel, sorry, prosperity gospel preachers in the States who say that you can have your best life now. God was the first on the scene and he declared through wisdom, this is how you have an abundant life. My wisdom is the key to an abundant life and it's not the abundant life you're thinking of, Joel Osteen. It's something far more glorious. And so Lady Wisdom offers God's way of life. And it's a whole lot like how God offers us the gospel, isn't it? The parallels are incredible. As Lady Wisdom declares her wisdom to the city and says, Here, here, come and, come and take it. It's free. I will not charge you anything for it. Wisdom freely on offer. Just repent. Return. Repent at my rebuke. Come and I will give you wisdom. Isn't this exactly what God does in the gospel to our world? Is that exactly not the message that we're declaring? Are we not saying, world, I offer you life. I offer you God's blessed life. All you have to do is repent, return, come to Christ and live. It's not hard. And if you're watching this evening or if you're watching this in 58 evenings time, on a recording, and you haven't returned. The offer is here before you tonight. The offer of life, of wisdom, of a way of life that makes sense. And it's grounded in Christ Jesus. It's grounded in the one who would die. To obtain you life. For wisdom, it's grounded in the one who gives wisdom, which is Jesus. But notice that wisdom doesn't just shout out. Well, I mean, it, it definitely shouts out the whole time. But it shouts out judgment. Wisdom judges. Verse 24. I have called. See, here's the reality. Wisdom shouts out this message, this invitation, this offer. Come, just repent and come to me and I will give you wisdom. Verse 24. Because I have called and you refuse to listen. Have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. What is it? It's a, it's a, it's a justification, isn't it? It's a justification for judgment. It's, Lady Wisdom is about to lay the hammer blow. She's about to like strike the anvil with the hammer, seal the deal on judgment. But she explains first why. She says, this is why I'm going to judge you. Because I have offered wisdom and you have refused it. I have offered God's insight, God's understanding, God's wisdom. And yet, and yet, you refused to listen. And yet, you refused my hand. And yet, you ignored my counsel. You would have none of my reproof. You would not listen. And you can almost hear the, hear the dad, can't you? 
scolding the child. The dad warned the child. The father rebuked the behavior of the child. The child did it anyway. And you can, you can almost picture the father, can't you? I told you this would happen. I told, how, how many times have we spoken about this? I have told you this before. This is unacceptable behavior. Therefore, this is the punishment. This is the judgment. Well, what's the punishment? What's the judgment of wisdom? I also will laugh, verse 26. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. It's a damning judgment. It's a damning judgment. I will laugh at your calamity. And you think, well, that, that sounds a bit vindictive, doesn't it? That sounds a bit harsh. Well, if it was only written here, maybe we could say it was Solomon being a bit overzealous. Except for it's actually a theme all through the Old Testament. It's a theme all through the Bible. So in, in Deuteronomy 28, if you've got your Bibles there, in Deuteronomy 28, in one of the great passages on curses and blessings, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 63, the Lord says through Moses, and as, hear this, as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you. So just hear that again. As the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, he delighted in causing good things for you. So the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. And you shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Or again, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18 to 19. This is Israel asking for a king. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. I think that's a, bit, that's a bit harsh. They're asking for help and he will not listen. He will turn a deaf ear. Or again, to drive home the point, Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 13. Verse 12 and 13. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked. For he sees his day coming. Now just picture that for a second. The wicked are doing evil. And the Lord, the Lord looks ahead in the timeline of history. He looks ahead to what everything that's planned. He looks down the timeline of history and he says, Oh, I know your end. I see your day of judgment coming. And he laughs. You might think, oh, what kind of God is that? Isn't God meant to be loving and graceful? Isn't God meant to be just merciful and kind and lovely to everybody? What's this wisdom laughing at people in their, in their misery and suffering? Well, God, just like pictured here as Lady Wisdom, God laughs in the day of judgment. God holds in derision on the day of judgment because we've refused. Because God for our entire life has said to us, here is wisdom. Our entire life we've heard, here is love vast as the ocean. Our entire life 
We've heard the gospel preached. We've seen his handiwork in creation. We've seen wisdom written on the clouds. We've seen everything he's done. He's called to us. He's called to us. Wisdom's called in the streets, called in the streets, called in the streets. Christians have been in our workplaces, in our marketplaces. They've been everywhere. The, the, the touch of the Christian life is everywhere in creation. And God's handiwork is everywhere that the Christian is not. And so when judgment finally comes, wisdom laughs. Why? Because wisdom had offered them another way. And so now wisdom holds them in derision. And here's the thing. God will do the same thing. Why is this important? It's important because... There will be a day when there shall be no more mercy for the sinner. There's, there's mercy on offer today. There's wisdom on offer today. There's grace on offer right now as I preach to you of Jesus Christ. But there will be a day when God will cease to be merciful. Let me say that again. There will be a day when God will cease to show mercy. He's always merciful. It's one of his attributes. But there will be a day when he will cease to show mercy and grace and wisdom and kindness and love to sinners. They will go to hell for eternity. And they will be judged for eternity. And God will hold them in derision. Or to use the proverb, he will laugh at them because they refused to come. They refused the gospel. They hardened their hearts. Maybe maybe you've met these sorts of people. They've been told about the gospel many times and they just refuse to listen. They just don't care. They've grown up in Sunday school. They've grown up in church. And you say to them, can I tell you about Jesus? And they say, I want nothing. I want nothing to do with that. Don't even dare speak to me about it. No help will come for them, the proverb says in verse 28. I will, they will call and I will not answer. They will seek me, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. I offered them everything. I stood on the sh- sheet. I stood on the streets, and I called forth, and they did not want it. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way, and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. You see, in the end. In the end, look, there's a lot of things about eternity that I disagree with C.S. Lewis, but there's one thing which I think he gets right. And that is that, in a sense, sinners are going to get what they want. You see, sinners don't want God. And so they'll get an eternity without Him. I mean, they'll have an eternity of God, of God's wrath and judgment and damnation, But they're going to get what they wanted. They sowed wickedness and they will reap the consequence. They sowed hatred and they will receive it. These fools, the fools of the earth. God offers them wisdom and they throw it back at him. They say, get that away from us. Church, be quiet. Silence yourself. We want Marxism. We want gender transformation. We want adultery. We want gluttony. We want homosexuality. We want sin. We want pride. We want vice. We want all of the insatiable desires of the lust of the flesh. And we want it now. And when the church says, We offer you another way. 
We offer you Christ and his glory. They throw it back in our face and so they'll get what they want because they refuse to come to Christ. There is a day of judgment coming. And the question for, for you, my, my dear friend, my dear viewer, is are you, wait, are you waiting? Is, is, it, is it going to be too late someday for you? Will Christ return and will you cry out, I'll come now? You see, many on that day are going to cry out, Lord, Lord, what about me? And Jesus will cast them into the outer darkness and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. What are you waiting for? Have you grown up in the church? What are you waiting for? Have you come to Christ? Have you come to wisdom and seen that there is a way greater than what this world has to offer? Are you waiting in the darkness when the light is on offer? Are you waiting in sin while righteousness is given? Are you waiting in damnation when eternal life is before you? Are you sitting under the wrath of God when there is peace at hand. Come. Will you come? But I don't ask that. Wisdom asks that. Verse 33. Whoever listens to me will dwell secure. Here's this final offer. Whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. You see, this final offer contains an invitation to come, but it also, it offers hope for those who have. Have you come to Christ? Have you come to wisdom? Have you found the righteousness of God? Praise be to God. You will be at ease without dread of disaster. Now, does that mean you're going to live your best life now? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean you're going to live your best life now but it means you will avoid destruction. You will avoid disaster. And you will live, most importantly, you will live without the dread of disaster. You see, the world freaks out. Isn't that what this coronavirus panic's all about? People are terrified. Why? Because if they die, they don't know where they're going. Well, some of them do know where they're going. They don't know where they're going. If you die, you have no dread, do you? You have no dread. You have no dread of dying, of disaster, because you're secure in Christ, because you've been saved, you've been redeemed, you've been made well, you've been healed, you've been made righteous, you've been justified, you've been adopted. You're a son and daughter of God. And so you're held firm. As we sung earlier, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. Lady, Lady Wisdom. She offers God's wisdom. For God's world. You know, and as I, as I read the psalm, you know, one of the first things that popped into my head as I started doing my sermon work, it was, it was Luke 19, 41 to 44. You remember... Remember the part of the story of the death of Christ where he enters Jerusalem. And, and we picture him heading in towards Jerusalem. And there's that, that moment where he pauses. And he weeps. Do you remember what he says? He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, how I, how I long to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks. But you were not willing. 
if you had known, if you had known the day of the coming of peace, if you had known the day of my coming, you would have lived. But now you're going to be destroyed. That's the story of this proverb, isn't it? Oh, my world, my world. You can almost hear Christ in this proverb. Oh, oh, fools. Oh, simple ones. Oh, scoffers. How I, how I would long to gather you up. But you are not willing. Will you be gathered up? Will you be gathered up? And if you have been gathered up, will you carry forth the message of Christ? You see, while a day is coming where it will be too late, that day has not yet come. It's not too late yet. So let us work with all our might. Let us work with a zeal for souls. That as, as one author put it, I think it was Spurgeon, who said, we will hold on to their legs all the way to the gates of hell. They may go there, but we'll do everything we can to stop them. Let us, let us stand like barriers and make them walk over the top of us and ground us into the dust before we see them cross over into hell. This world's perishing. Or as the slang saying goes, it's going to hell in a handbasket. But we hold forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have become the bearers of wisdom. Will you join me in heralding? along with 2,000 years of church history. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for the wisdom of God on offer. Lord, we pray for those who do not know you. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for our family. We pray for our friends. We pray for our work colleagues. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our city. We pray for our region. We pray for New Zealand. We pray for the Pacific. We pray for the Southern Hemisphere. We pray for this world. That God, you would carry your wisdom and gospel into the hearts of men and women. That you like Lady Wisdom, would offer Christ. May we see fruit. Oh, Lord, may we see fruit. Amen.